Hello? Hello? Nice to meet you, everyone. So building a decentralized community is something that is widely underestimated in this space and often approached in the wrong way. And if you mismanage it, this community building exercise could turn on you. So community building is a necessary precursor to the success of any project in that you have to, le you have to be able to build a shelling point around your project before anyone will adopt it. So for example, if you did an ICO in 2017, and let's say you optimized for the largest distribution possible to a community of speculators. Unfortunately, a lot of the times, they, all they will care about is the return on investment for buying your token and not necessarily care about your project itself. So all of a sudden, you're in a position where these speculators are putting pressure on you and your team in order to launch your mainnet or build a product or do something that is going to help them bump the price of your token so that they could trade it off in the end. And so you don't want that. The people in your team start to mm, crack under pressure. You might start having turnover in your team. And now you're dealing with um, internal turmoil and organizational issues on top of having to launch a product or a mainnet to appease your spec your speculators. So you don't want to put yourself or your team in that position where your community could potentially turn on you. You don't want to do that, and that's because you're building world-changing ideas, and having internal issues is not something you need, to, you need to deal with. So there's another more prominent problem in blockchain, and we'll talk a little bit about that. When you're building blockchains in the open, how do you create defensible moats around your product? Who here thinks it's the tech? Who here thinks the moat is the tech? All right, well, you, guys, you guys got it right. The, def the most defensible moat that you could have around your software is actually your real life community. It's the hardest thing to fork and you have real users that are loyal to your project. So a lot of the times the tech is really important to get smart people on board and excited about your project, but the most important thing would be community building. And they're the ones who's going to evangelize it to other people, and that's how you would scale. So I like to go back to the example of Ethereum. Ethereum has the largest community, and even all of the ETH killers that have raised $4 billion haven't successfully killed ETH. And that's because Ethereum has that defensible moat around themselves. Ethereum has. 595 active authors to its code base, and they have 221,000 uh, contracts running on the EVM today still, and no other project has come close to that kind of adoption. ETH has built a moat around itself because of its community. But as a new project, if you're trying to establish yourself in the space, how do you, number one, stand out to people Number two, establish legitimacy in this mm, ecosystem full of noise. And number three, how do you build a defensible moat around your platform? So at Tendermint, if you don't know, Tendermint powers the Cosmos network. We built the second largest community of developers in the space. We have 368 active mm, contributors to our code base. And that's even larger than the number of contributors to the Bitcoin code base. So if you haven't heard of Tendermint, hopefully a lot of you have. We are the protocol that Libra and Binance Chain are based on. They use uh, derivatives of Tendermint BFT. And if you're wondering why I'm talking about community building, it's because I'm the director of community at Tendermint, where we went through the work of building up our community from scratch. So I joined almost three years ago, and uh, let me tell you, it takes a lot of work doing that. We started building our community in 2017. We started a validator working group and really didn't get any traction when we launched our test nets. But it wasn't until we launched an incentivized test net before we got meaningful traction from validators. And that's kind of how it all began. So we got competent people to run our software, 
and then those competent people built businesses off of um, the protocol that we built, and then we were able to scale that way. So by running an intent, by running an incentivized testnet, it, it still costs a lot of time and energy and resources. We had to launch it, we had to you know, do all the overhead of collecting KYC, and then on top of that, it took maybe like nine months before we even were able to launch a, a real mainnet. And so it takes a lot of time to build your community. And some of you who are just starting out on this journey are thinking about, maybe I could take a shortcut. The bad news is there are no shortcuts. Sorry, my, uh, my slides. Okay, the bad news is there are no shortcuts. The good news is we might have a plausible way to get you on an expedited track to building a community. So the mechanism that will allow people to tap into the Cosmos community is something that we are calling Supernova. Are you guys seeing my slides? Oh, sorry. Okay, so Supernova is this new idea about creating a shelling point around validators, users, investors, and general token holders. Basically, Supernova is a blockchain that is going to help distribute airdrops in a radically, mm, in a radically new way because before people were, were before when people were doing airdrops they would directly send airdrops over to users and in in the era where the SEC is scrutinizing everything you do even the act of giving airdrops could be seen as a risky action and if you did if you offloaded that responsibility onto a chain in which a bunch of validators could distribute it for you in a more decentralized fashion that is one of those reasons why um, you could derive value from using Supernova. So, <sighs> airdrops. Airdrops are this age-old way of um, trying to import communities who hold tokens of an existing token like ETH or Bitcoin. So, this is sort of similar to that, but we're not doing unsolicited airdrops. Who here has opened up their MetaMask wallet only to check that you have five new shit coins in there that you don't know about? Right, unsolicited airdrops, right, and you didn't opt in for it, right? So, and, and so chances are you don't care about those projects that you got airdrops from, and a lot of those times, the unsolicited airdrops do not work as intended for the projects who are giving out the airdrops. How this relates to Supernova is that uh, supernova is airdrops on steroids. You're not going to get unsolicited airdrops from Supernova, but this is a radical new way of reimagining how people will build communities. So to illustrate, okay, to illustrate, we'll go through the user flow of the supported chains on um, on Supernova. So initially, Supernova will support the Bitcoin chain, the ETH 1.0 chain, and the Cosmos hub. Meaning, if you are a token holder of any of those chains, you will be able to participate in Supernova. The user flow of a Bitcoin holder would be, you hold Bitcoin, and you want to lock it up on the Supernova chain. You're not, okay, a distinction is, you're not locking up the token on the Supernova chain, you're locking it up on the Bitcoin chain. So all you're doing is not, pro you're not moving your tokens from the Bitcoin chain, and if you're, if, you're, if you're using the Ethereum chain, you're not moving your tokens from ETH. If you're using the Cosmos hub chain, you're not moving your atoms. So that's called the lockup. When you lock it up using something like the Supernova UI, you go onto the Supernova UI, you see a list of however many projects, like 100 projects, let's say, and let's pretend you don't know any of those projects. Now you're like, okay, well, what am I locking up my tokens for? Now, imagine remembering that a girl with purple hair told you at SF Blockchain Week that there is a show that is associated with the Supernova blockchain. Now you go on the show, let's say it's on YouTube, the show is formatted like a, you know, like a pitch contest, kind of like, kind of like a shark tank where there's going to be uh, a panel of judges, they are experts in the field, and maybe they have substantial resources, maybe they're investors, they're large token holders, or whatever, 
they're judges, and then there are projects that come on the show. So let's say five projects get on the show, they pitch the judges, the judges ask them questions, and then by the end of that show, you have invested one hour of your time and you walked away with a good impression about which projects are, uh, maybe have legitimacy. So maybe you walk away with knowing that three of the projects that came on the show are like something that you may want airdrops from. So now you go back onto the supernova UI and you're saying, okay, I have Bitcoin. I'm not, if I'm not spending my Bitcoin anywhere, they're just sitting there in a cold wallet, maybe I could lock them up. So I'm gonna lock them up on the supernova chain. I'm going to pick the three projects on the supernova UI that I want airdrops from. And then you lock it up for six months and then at the end of those six months, and the project, given that the project launches, you will receive free airdrops from those projects. Now, if you're an atom holder, this process is slightly different. If you're an atom holder because it's running on proof of stake, you are, if you are bonded, and let's say you're earning block rewards on the Cosmos Hub because you're staked, you could simultaneously use those same atoms lock it up on Supernova, and receive block rewards from staking atoms on top of receiving airdrops from Supernova. So that's how that would work. It is extra juicy for atom holders. Okay, now let's go into the next one. Okay, so if, you're pro if you are a project, why would you want to go on Stardust Live? And why would you find it beneficial to use the Supernova chain? So as a project, it's hard to distinguish yourself from a lot of different projects that are issuing noise. So as a project, it's really hard to gain legitimacy um, in the space. So you want, mm, brand recognition by going on the Stardust Live show. Let's say the show is called Stardust Live. So you want, you want brand recognition and people know that it's, very, it's difficult to get onto the show. However, what's notable is that the Supernova chain is completely permissionless to list your project. So there's probably go, going to be you know, hundreds of different projects on the Supernova chain, but only five get on the, Super, the Stardust show. Now, if you want to register on the Supernova chain, you have to go through the regular registration process and you have to allocate a percentage of your token supply for airdrops to, to give to the Supernova chain to distribute for you. What's the incentive? The incentive is for you not to go through the same grueling three years of work that we did at Tendermint in order to bootstrap our community from scratch, launching incentivized test nets, you know, hiring different community managers, launching a marketing campaign, you know, sponsoring workshops, and getting a PR agency. It's, it, it's a lot of work to do all of that just to onboard real community members, given that you're not opting for, you know, let's say fake Telegram group members, people who could actually contribute to your community. This idea ties back to the idea of building a defensible moat around your project. You want real people who are really passionate about your project. How much would it cost in millions of dollars doing what I mentioned for marketing, like hosting meetups, sponsoring, sponsoring conferences, and uh, throwing parties and whatnot? So that cost ranges between 250,000 and 3.5 million dollars, depending on how big of a presence you want. So to get to the size of Tendermint or let's say MakerDAO, to get to that level of presence, that's roughly about how much you'd spend. So let's go over the Supernova chain features a little bit. It is powered by Tendermint BFT. It is built with the Cosmos SDK. Again, it is a permissionless listing for projects to go through Supernova. There is no on-chain governance, and that, yeah, that is because I want to divorce uh, token voting with security of the chain. And Supernova chain is essentially a light client that witnesses events that occur on its supported chains, such as Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the Cosmos Hub. And in the future, we want to support Binance Chain. 
finance chain has very aligned incentives um, and are very closely related with Cosmos. Handshake, because, how many of you have heard of it, about Handshake? Oh, yeah. So we want to support Handshake because what they did is they built a library that airdrops, on, that does anonymous airdrops to the open source community. So they, what they did was they crawled GitHub's API and they pulled in every single GitHub contributor that had more than 15 followers in the hopes that they would, you know, maybe integrate the Handshake package, like they would integrate um, Handshake into the packages that they maintain, right? A lot of the open source developers maintain a lot of projects, a lot of Linux projects. And so if we are able to onboard those communities and allow Supernova Chain to become the gateway that, that introduces those open source developers into the rest of the cryptocurrency ecosystem, hello? Sorry, that would be very powerful. And next, we'll want to do lock dropping. Lock dropping is another feature that I haven't mentioned earlier, but lock dropping is basically the airdrops. I've been talking about airdrops this whole time, but really you're lock dropping because you're locking tokens in order to receive drops from the project. So lock dropping is something that I want to introduce um, with Dylan, because Dylan is one of the co-founders of Commonwealth Labs. They're the people who created the idea of a lock drop. And so we're you know, partnering with Commonwealth Labs to bring Supernova Chain into existence. So this is Dylan. Please introduce the lock drop. Thank you. Is the mic on? All right. Um, hey, everyone. Thank you, Chango, for uh, introducing me. I'm super excited to be here to introduce um, the lock drop. Um, uh, Commonwealth Labs is a team based here in San Francisco, New York, uh, Israel, and Detroit. Um, so all the top blockchain cities um, and more. Um, so we started a project called Edgeware, and it's a proof of stake network. And we faced a lot, basically all the challenges that Django mentioned. Building a community, trying to distribute this token um, in a fair, wide, and easy manner. And we looked through airdrops. We thought about you know, not doing an ICO. Um, and all these other mechanisms. And we ended up with the idea of lock drop. And so this idea is basically all you have to do is lock up your Ethereum um, in a smart contract. It creates a child contract, which holds those funds separately, not to be used by anyone, and only to be claimed by you. You'd get that token back at the end of six months. And you'd also get a new token in a new network. Um, it's been really successful. We've seen 10,000 people uh, participate over the summer. And we're really, really excited to bring that uh, basically to every single project. And so onboarding Ethereum, onboarding Bitcoin, onboarding Atom and h and uh, and BNB holders, um, we're really excited to partner with Django to do that. Thank I'll you, Dylan. back to you. Yeah, so, so Dylan sort of magically appeared in front of me as if cosmic happenstance were to happen because I was thinking of this mechanism about how do we Mm, how do we allow people who are holders of existing tokens to double dip into all of these new projects that are going to be coming out into the ecosystem? And then I sort of ran into a roadblock, which was, okay, how is this going to be securities law compliant? And then Dylan explained the idea of a lock drop and said, okay, well, this is how it is compliant with the Howey test, is because it's a lock. And because you're locking existing users, then the assumption, the implication is that you already have existing users before you have launched a mainnet. And so by interpretation of the Howey test, that is, that is considered compliant. Of course, this idea is not validated because the SEC hasn't said, yes, you know, if you do a lock drop, you're not you know, like violating the Howey test. But it's experimental, and it works given the current guidelines. So that's just a little aside. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the dust token mechanics. So Stardust is going to be the name of the show, and dust will be the name of the token for this chain. And the reason we need a token for this chain is because we need a staking token to secure this blockchain because it is an application-specific chain happening independently of the Cosmos Hub. It's sort of like a booster pack. 
Of course, you could extrapolate this supernova idea for any project, and once we open source this code, which I believe we're open sourcing it today, you will be able to fork it and you know, use it for your project. However, again, going back to the idea of a defensible moat, this would not have value for you if you do not have a community for people to take, for, you know, to, to, to build around. So, given that, given that we have spent the three years of building a, uh, an, a, a growing community, an, an establishing community, um, this would be valuable to use, given that Cosmos, Bitcoin, Ethereum have rather, you know, the largest communities in the space. So there will be a pre-mine of 30%. So there will be an initial lock drop period of six months. The lock drop period hasn't begun yet because it is pending um, auditing of the code and actually building of the chain. So after six months of locking up your tokens, everyone who participated in that initial lock drop period will receive 30% of the dust in proportion to how much they have locked up. And uh, it is a deflationary asset. Uh, is a deflationary asset. I really like Bitcoin's um, economic model of having 21 million tokens ever to exist. I'm a proponent of having value from something rather than value from nothing. So that's why I opt for deflationary rather than inflationary asset. There will be a halving every you know four years or so. And so in the future, we want to implement a Uniswap module on this chain. This is, this is a proposal, of course. But what that would do is, let's say you participated in the initial lock drop period, and now you receive dust. And now you are staking dust, and so you're earning more dust. What happens when we have a Uniswap mechanism that allows you to optionally swap the dust that you have out such that you do not have to lock up any more Bitcoin, Ether, or Atom, you could swap it out for future airdrops. And notably, Dylan mentioned the Edgeware project um, in which people were staking, I'm sorry, people locked up ETH on the Edgeware project. So anyone who locked up ETH on Edgeware will also doubly count for Supernova, and so you will receive dust if you participated in Edgeware. Notably, if you're a signaler on Edgeware, you do not get anything. Does anyone know what Edgeware signaling is? Okay, don't worry about it. <laughs> okay, going, going over the logistics real quickly. So, so there's an initial lock drop period once more, and initial lock droppers who receive tokens from, from Dust will have the option to validate the supernova chain. Again, because there is no on-chain governance, the staking portion is purely to secure the blockchain, to provide collateral so that people don't double spend the chain. And here's another thing. If the project that you locked up tokens for does not launch in a two-year window, your tokens auto unlock and you get your money back. That's, that's a guarantee so you don't get locked up in there forever. And Stardust Live, we talked a little bit about the show. Um, slated to go into production around Q1 or Q2 2020, but don't hold me to it because we have historically been extremely bad at giving timelines. Okay, so grab your phones. If you find this to be interesting, this is an open project. I would love for each and every one of you to contribute. All of the things that we mentioned earlier about the parameters, about the economic model, is up to um, receiving feedback. So if you want to get sprinkled with dust, please scan this QR code. <laughs> Your contributions are welcome, and you should be an active member in building community for the entire ecosystem. Okay, does anyone need time? Of course, we have a QR code at the very end of the slide too, so if you don't get a chance to do it, um, you will have the opportunity to do so. I'm almost out of time. <sighs> so ultimately, why are we doing this? The reason why I want us to do this as an entire industry is because there's so much work, there's so much foundational groundwork to be done in order to push this whole blockchain thing into the mainstream that I don't want any project to have to start out from scratch, have to be burdened by building their community from scratch. So maybe if we could all get ourselves into this mm, expedited lane to build your community, you could get that out of the way, you could get help from anyone, uh, you know, 
any validators that are in this supernova chain and existing community they've built, if you are able to import all of those communities onto your project such that you're not having to do it from scratch, then I think we could get forward faster. As in, okay, sorry. <laughs> I'll just end this talk with a quote from Carl Sagan. Okay, so Carl Sagan says, I apologize, I didn't memorize the quote, so I have to read it to you. He says, the nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, and the carbon in our apple pies were made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are all made of stardust. Thank you.